What's up, guys? Big music day. T Swift drops a new album, Sturgill Simpson Surprise Album Volume 2. So, very excited about that. But unfortunately, we won't be talking music today. We're talking hoops. Before I jump into the shy away, got all the guys that you do not want to draft this year. I just want to remind you everything's on sale over at Established Run. We got the draft kit up. You can get it for free if you buy the in season p- package now. So, just get ahead of it because you're going to want that in season package. I know it for sure. Mike Gallagher, we're getting snow here. I'm guessing there's no snow out in Zona. How you doing? Been raining pretty cold. Uh, get the hoodie break out. Um, yeah, feeling pretty good. Had a good day yesterday. Drew and I spent a lot of time on projections and stuff. It was really cool. What do you think of the T-Swift album? No comment. Yeah. <laughs> Drew, I know for sure know you have not listened to these new albums. How are you doing? <laughs> no, I haven't. Um, although I, I I don't mind T-Swift, so maybe I should be listening to to those albums. But no, I, I did not uh, infuse my life with any music, just more NBA, just straight into the veins. Only yeah, Swift thing not- I know is Escargo, My Cargo, 150 Swiftly. I haven't heard T-Swift yet, but my wife is a big fan, so I will be hearing plenty of it soon, probably as soon as I'm done recording this podcast. I did listen to Sturgill this morning, and uh, I loved it, but Sturgill's pretty much my favorite artist out there. If you don't know him, check him out. All right, enough of that. Let's get into some basketball talk. The shy away. These are guys you do not want on your team. Gallagher's got 20, no, 30, 30 guys listed on the site. Of course, this is behind the draft kit paywall. We're going to go through some of them today just to give you a taste, but you're going to have to get the draft kit to access all of them. Let's start at the top with a controversial figure. He's a guy I think I might be drafting on my season long team. Very sad to see him on here. Gallagher, try and talk me out of Steph Curry this year. Well, uh, it's actually getting a little warm in here. So, uh, yeah, let me uh, talk about that real quick. <laughs> a little showmanship for me, huh? Um, yeah, I love Curry, man. Um, it's just games played. He's older. He's 32. He's going to miss. He's gonna probably miss time. He's going to have more ball in his, the ball in his hands more. So it puts him at more risk. So it's simple as that. Just injury risk. That's Is all I got. Fair? <laughs> Is it really fair to call him an injury risk? Because, look, I know he had the ankle problems early in his career. Then he, he ran off a bunch of seasons where he played all the games. And then I know, you know, obviously he missed all last year. That was kind of a fluke wrist injury. So I'm not worried about that. He had missed some games, I believe mostly with the ankle uh, in, in some of those late Durant years. But I don't know, man. He's, you know, now he's he's had a, a year off. He's rested up. Drew, is it fair to call Steph Curry injury prone? So the injury prone, the label is is... I think it's a difference without a distinction in in terms of this situation, because whether he's injury prone or not, I don't think that takes away from the fact that he's a player that's getting into his thirties that is going to have the ball in his hands a ton. And just that profile in general from his size um, is one that is going to start to induce a little bit more risk. And then you've got a team that you've seen be willing to kind of shut things down when things aren't, aren't, you know, going well, as we saw last year, I do think the trade for Kelly Oubre certainly suggests that there's more insulation from that risk this year than last year. But look, it's an older veteran team that took on a lot of games during kind of their dynasty run in terms of the playoffs. They basically added a a full another regular season kind of on top of what they had been playing. So I think for those reasons alone, whether regardless of Steph's, you know, history, just the, the, the volume of miles kind of on the odometer are, are substantial It's a really interesting player this year because I came into the season thinking or hoping that you might get a discount on him in the MVP odd market odds markets in season long markets. And there's just really not that much of a discount going on with him. And I think that's, you know, essentially why he makes this list for Mike. It's that, you know, he does have all the upside in the world to be, you know, a a number one overall player in eight cat or nine cat leagues, but you're not getting any sort of, real big discount it looks like the adp is still hanging around you know first round mid first round depending on kind of the league format that you're in so i love stuff i hope we get a monster stuff year i'd love to see one more monster stuff year um but i was also hoping to get a discount somewhere on him to bet on that this year and i haven't found the opportunity to do so yet yeah and it really just comes down to who you're taking him ahead of him you know like i mentioned kind of the big five guys i feel like and ad harden Dame, Jokic, and Kat, and even you could throw Luca or Trey in there. So like, it's hard to make a case for him over those dudes, in my opinion. They all have pretty similar ceilings, and obviously Curry has the worst floor, in my opinion. 
Yeah, well, just to to put it in context a little bit, we've got him projected at 57 games. I think that is probably conservative, if anything. I don't know. Look, there's always the, the chance that they shut him down because the season goes sideways. But I think they'll be hanging around to get into the playoffs, especially given that we've got the plan now. So you, you only need to be top 10. Um, and if they're if they're in play for that, they're going to try and get into the playoffs. Like Steph is a competitive dude, and I'm sure after all the time off, he's he's going to want to be back in the playoffs. So I don't know. You know, if, if he ends up playing closer to a full slate of games, like he's he's going to buy for the number one spot. Maybe you know, who's, we'll we'll see what happens with Harden. Who's who's the guy that that? So you know, Mike kind of outlined you know the the big five for lack of a better phrasing of of guys that feel a little bit stable and and ahead of him. Um, you could include Giannis there. It just kind of depends on the league format that you're playing in and whatnot. But like Andrew, for you wanting to, wanting to draft stuff and wanting to be high on stuff this year, where's, where's kind of the, the, the tier drop off for you that you're like, I, I would take stuff above these guys clearly all day, every day. Is it the, the Beal, Paul George, Kevin Durant kind of range? Is it like, where is it? Cause it's just, yeah, I it's, think he's, I think he's ahead of all those guys. I have him and, ahead of him too. Those guys. Yeah, we, We've got him at. Uh, I'm just looking at the ETR projections right now, and he's number six. I feel like a lot of he, leagues he's yeah. going to be floating around like the lower, the lower half of the first round. So it's not, it's not like a big reach. And then you're basically just hoping that he plays all the games, and then and he's probably a top three guy if he plays like over sixty games. Maybe that's asking too much. I've always had a soft spot for for older players. You know, like I, I always hang on a little too long, and it has burned me many many times so i guess i'm kind of the anti gallagher in that sense and you'll see with this list uh, it's mostly old dudes which is you know it's a good strategy especially this year with all the chaos that's going to come with covid and everything like you're better off getting the younger guys because uh, teams are going to rest guys you know they'll just lean into resting guys you know there's more back-to-backs etc cetera, etc cetera. so i don't know I-, I can definitely see both ways on stuff and it probably just comes down to what the price is going to be in your league and, and if you can get him at the like the bottom half of the first round i think by all means if, if he's going like five i don't know that's maybe you're, you're paying closer to to like the top part of his output range there and i should add on the sideway 30 i kind of ranked them in order of magnitude of how, and like how important it is so like i put the higher guys up a little because it's a more important decision early so i put him at number three Kyrie's number one so think about if you're reading it to kind of consider that and yeah, if you're listening and- on a podcast, I'm wearing a Curry jersey right now. So, <laughs> <laughs> should have mentioned that. Yeah, I didn't notice yeah. it right away when you unzipped. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. All right, let's talk. I guess we should just note or make make a small note on Kyrie since he is number one. Just give the like the thirty second spiel on him, Gallagher. Yeah, games missed, missed twenty eight games per season over the last five seasons. I mean, just no thank you. We saw today, man. Really cold blooded comments from him today, Colin. People pawns um, that he has to talk to, like, dude, man. Like, I want to like Kyrie, man, but I thought he wasn't going to talk to the media. Now he's out calling people pawns. I didn't see this quote you know, yet. Yeah, you know, it came out like an hour ago or so. So yeah, you'll see. Oh, it. So that lasted all, all of two to three days of not talking to media. I mean, talk yeah. about a clown. He's just unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. All right, we don't need to say anything else about Kyrie. You, and you know what? To me, with season long too, there's some aspect of wanting to root for the guys, and I think that's part of the reason why I want Curry. And I would just never ever draft Kyrie. Uh, I just don't like rooting yeah. for the guy. Number two yeah. on the list, we have Porzingis. I don't think there's a ton to be said there. It's, we're just very worried about his health, which is which is a big time bummer. He's not going to be ready for the season. He's not going to play back to backs. I don't know if they've said that for sure, but I feel pretty comfortable they saying did. it. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, so it's just, we don't know. Um, there's just too much risk there. Blake Griffin, we got number four, similar, similar story, although he's, he's been a little bit healthier of late. Uh, but I think there's a decent chance he could get traded. I don't know when you've got a $40 million contract this year and next year. Um, but remains to be seen trade would not help him. Drew he anything was to add on Blake? last year too. So I'll just to add that. So Drew, you got I- anything to add on Blake? On Blake, no, not yeah. really. I mean, the 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 thing the thing about this is, with some guys, it's about cost. With some guys, it's about kind of you don't want them kind of like at at I don't want to say any cost, but at you know even in the ranges, kind of they're going around. Blake right now is is going. Around. I'm looking up ADPs on NFBKC, which is the league we'll be competing in on the main event on on Tuesday night, um, and Blake's going around 99 or so. Um, and I, I just, there's still pretty darn good players around that level that have a lot more upside and, and ceiling to them. And all the quotes around Blake too have just been 
basically all the quotes around the veterans on the Pistons have been more about mentorship than yep. about, uh, you know, playing well this year. So just be, be, be uh, a little bit cautious about the veteran Pistons guys. All right. Let's talk about some younger guys. I think that's a little bit more interesting. Zion is a guy that people are going to want to draft. Talk about a guy that's fun to have on your team. There are concerns. I mean, the blocks weren't there at all. And, and, I mean, he, correct me if I'm wrong, Gallagher, but he was he had pretty good defensive stats in, in college, right? We expected that to come yeah. over. W- w- you know, why do you think that hasn't translated to the NBA so far? And is it is there reason for optimism there? I mean, it can't get any worse, right? Yeah, it can't get any worse. I think in hindsight, a lot of his blocks were on like perimeter guys, on like kind of you know five feet and out, where like guys who were really crushing in blocks are crushing on at the rim within five feet. So I think that was part of it. Um, I think the steals were a little bit. I think the steals are probably more surprising than the box, um, because he's a guy who could really. He's long. He's fast. He's got the quick first step. So just didn't work out. Um, I mentioned in the column, 103 minutes in the bubble, zero blocks or steals. Like, come on, dude. Uh, and then he's gonna sit. Anything goes wrong, he's gonna sit three or four games. It's just, it's unfortunate, but he's gonna be really tough to own. Let's talk a little bit about the bubble. They had him on a minutes limit, which was really bizarre because we didn't. There was no injury that we could tie it to. So, I, Drew, do you think maybe he had COVID and they just didn't tell us, or what do you think was going on there? I don't know, man. Um, I think you know he left. He left the bubble right and then came back. So he had some sort of personal issue that that delayed his kind of return. And I don't know if that they were concerned about his conditioning kind of ramping up. I mean, coming into the bubble, we saw like all these you know, pictures of Zion looking kind of ready to go. And then I think they got off to a tough start in the bubble and they were like, Oh, you know, this, this is unlikely to work out the way we thought it did, which the whole freaking point of like the playing games is basically to give new Orleans a shot of getting into the playoffs. So we could see Zion in the playoffs. And so I think they just kind of backed off things there the, the interesting thing about Zion is just like, yeah, you're again, this comes down to price in that you're not getting any sort of discount on the fact that he did not contribute in steals and blocks and really doesn't contribute in threes either. And then from a free throw percentage is a negative. So like right off the bat in terms of eight cat or nine cat type leagues, you're immediately kind of fighting an uphill battle where he's going to be a negative in threes, which most bigs are. He's going to be a, a negative from free throw, which most bigs are, again, huge positive in field goal, obviously, and a positive in points and boards. But where's the steals and blocks? And that's really going to be the key to his value. And I don't know what that was about last year. I don't know if that was injuries kind of sapping some explosiveness in terms – or I don't know if it was effort. Um, it looked to me a lot to be more effort related. So he still has the big upside in him. But, again, you know, ADP right now around 35, you're you're – basically like asking for and, and i think it'll go higher than that like uh in in your in your home leagues and different things because of the name value um but i think you're you're kind of asking for the production right there we've got them a little bit lower than that on the on the eight cat rankings and on the nine cat rankings so it's not a terrible terrible value pick at that point but um as as mike said the risk you know is 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 still on the downside with how they're they're uh, intending to manage him yeah i think you let somebody else take the risk there i mean there's just too many good options this and you, you start you miss that early in the draft and and you're you're not it's in all great it's, shape. The, the thing that i would say is it's just like i think a guy that's interesting to compare him to is andre drummond because he's got some of this traditional like big man issues with with the free throw and and he's going to be really good in like points and boards and field goal and so basically like Andre Drummond is that guy kind of with less points but more steals and blocks and that's more valuable in eight cat and nine cat formats and they're going pretty similarly right and I think people are especially in home leagues are going to be way more in on Zion than they are Andre Drummond because it's, you know, a Cleveland Cavaliers center. It's not super exciting, but those are the types of players you're kind of looking at Zion around. And, you know, Gobert, Drummond, those types of guys, I think are, are better road, rotisserie fantasy players. I think that's a great point on Drummond. Let's jump to another injury prone slash minute limit 
big man who is extremely sexy, Joel Embiid. He ended up only averaging 29 and a half game, minutes per game last year. And, and the beginning of the season was when they said he was going to play. I don't remember the exact quote, but it was something like upper 30s. Do you remember how they worded that, Gallagher? 37 minutes. Well, that was in the bubble. Yeah, they were like, okay, Oh, was that sure. the bubble? Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I was like, okay. And, yeah, which um, yeah, didn't did not – I mean, he, he, he proceeded to get dinged up like almost immediately after they said that. So, that didn't end up happening. In the playoffs, he did play – Probably it looks about 36 minutes a game. Anyway, he had played 30, almost 34 minutes the season prior. So a lot of it comes down to like how many games is he going to play and how many minutes he's going to play. We've got him projected at 30 minutes per game at the moment. I think there are, there's some room for upside here. I mean, we've got the new coaching staff. We've, I think the roster is going to be much better suited to fantasy production this year. So I want to believe, but is he, he just too risky? You think Gallagher? Yeah, it's just games played. I think he's going to be awesome per game, actually. Like, DFS, we're going to play him. Um, more two-man game action they're talking about. They're talking about playing faster. He's in good shape, they're saying. Um, but, yeah, his block rate has dropped every year over his career. That's kind of interesting. Um, and even his scoring rate kind of dipped off last year, even if you take out the minute dip. So, yeah, it's kind of tough for him to be, like, truly a second-round guy with the downside. We've got him at 60 games played. And yeah, I mean, I think a huge part is that he he just hasn't been in shape for a lot of his time in the NBA. So maybe with the new staff, like maybe Doc can, can get him to, to stay in shape. I don't know. Drew, just, are you in or out on, on Embiid? I'm, I'm, I'm out on Embiid at current price. The current ADP in the NFBKC leagues is around 14, 15. Um, we've got him in like eight cat leagues around 19. He's also uh, even worse in nine cat leagues because of the turnover rate. Cause he has a really high turnover big man, which isn't something that you, know, you usually get a, a ton of. I, I like Mike am optimistic on the Sixers offense as a whole, but I'm more optimistic on it through Ben Simmons. Now Simmons is a very difficult player in category based leagues to kind of build around just because he's such a unique statistical option like he's basically like a big that comes with guard eligibility and so it becomes really hard to kind of build teams around that um but i i'm more optimistic on simmons relative to price than i am Embiid right now and i think there'll be you know I, I think we're probably a little bit more optimistic on tobias um compared to the market is my guess because i've been getting a, a ton of him yeah we're like 10 spots higher on, on him so Tobias is kind of one of the ways that I'm I'm getting some of that exposure to being more optimistic on on Philly, but maybe maybe not at cost on some of the big guys. I'll just say I'd take DeAndre Ayton over Embiid pretty easily. Yeah, I was just we, looking at we've got them like back kind of back to back in eight cat. I was just looking we've got them projected for the same games, and that's you know the eight and stuff on the games missed has been suspension related and stuff like that. Yeah. So I might need to bump Ayton's games up a few more and. Um, but those guys are, are, you know, pretty similar in our, in our mm -hmm. model kind of projections and rankings. And it looks like, you know, from a, from an ADP standpoint, um, Aiton is going, you know, like six, seven picks later. Yeah. A lot of, some yeah. early buzz on Aiton too. And he did take a while to get over that ankle injury last year. So not all the suspension, but uh, yeah. yeah, I definitely feel safer about his floor than Embiid's by quite a bit. And he has a higher minutes upside to me. Because there's not much depth behind him. I like that a lot. And I think we probably should bump him up a few few games. I mean, he should yeah. be projected for more than Embiid for sure. And just for comparison's sake, we have Aiton at 21 in 8-cat currently, Embiid at 19. But then if you go to 9-cat, uh, Aiton moves up to 18 and Embiid goes down to 27. So yeah. um, that's a pretty big gap, especially if we move a little bit more Aiton's way. And yeah, I mean, he'll be getting easier buckets with Chris Paul, et cetera. There's a lot of reasons to like Aiden, so maybe yeah, that's a good Drew, spot to bet on. Drew and that. I were talking about this yesterday. Sorry, um, there's a 9% true shooting difference between Steven Adams with Chris Paul versus without him. So, yeah, I think he can have a huge season. I like that. All right, let's talk about it. There's a couple Chicago Bulls on this list, actually, which I was a little surprised <laughs> to see. I see Zach Levine I can kind of understand because there seems like there's really nowhere to go but down for him because he was just a usage hog, and hopefully it's a little bit more of a balanced offense and just less flowing through him. But talk to me about him and, and Markkinen, who, I mean, can't get much worse than for, for him. And, and if he can get the shot to start falling, 
I don't know. It seems like there's decent upside there, but he shot terribly from three last year. Yeah, so I wrote this probably about two weeks ago, and actually it's kind of changed. Uh, I've kind of warmed up on Markkanen, even in Levine. I'm still where he's getting drafted. I still want to take him. But, um, yeah, just because he, you're paying for last year's stats. Levine had some injury issues even besides the ACL, so he had trouble staying on the court, so that's a factor for me. Um, but, yeah, just how much better could he get than last year is really the question. Uh, and Markkanen... I just think I just think it's gonna be Wendell Carter Jr. that's gonna be the guy that really vaults into uh, another stratosphere for value. Uh, some quotes today talking about you know getting the ball in high post, shooting threes. We talked about the drop coverages for more blocks. He says he's gonna get more blocks. So um, like if you're picking between one of the two, and they're going pretty close to each other, uh, give me Wendell by probably about a round and a half. I'm with yeah. you on, on Wendell. Drew, what do you think about the Bulls guys here? Yeah, I'm interested in Wendell. We've talked about that kind of at length over the last few podcasts. Lowry is, there's no discount on Lowry whatsoever. He's mm-hmm. going, you know, ADP is around 75 in NFBKC leagues. Um, right around, I mean, these, you know, I don't know how many drafts, I guess they've done like 18 drafts are included in this, so it's pretty small samples. Um, but it's right around Michael Porter Jr. in these NFBKC leagues. That's going to change substantially. Um, but there's no, there's no, you know, real big discount kind of going on here. Um so I, I think, I think if you're going to play the bull side of it, you know, Zach, I think there's, he's, I think he's priced like somewhat fairly. I don't think it's too bad. There are some concerns about playing with a healthier roster, how that impacts the usage playing alongside Kobe white more, who's a usage heavy player himself, as opposed to Sadoransky, who is more of kind of an off ball initiator um, type, like not a, not a heavy usage type. And so I think Zach is okay, but I think there's not much more upside to where he's priced. I think the guy, the guys that have all the upside in the world to where they're priced for the Bulls are, are Wendell Carter Jr. And then I think, honestly, um, we'll see where the price ends up on on Otto Porter. But I think Otto Porter has a lot of upside to him relative to where he's priced. It's always been a health thing with Otto Porter when he's been on the floor. He's been really effective. And if you're getting him like beyond the first like nine or ten rounds – now you're not really relying on him to do a ton for your roster. It's obviously better in leagues that have IR spots. It's better in leagues that have deeper benches and so on and so forth, which is a little bit tougher with the NFBKC format because those benches aren't super deep. Um, but Otto, Otto Porter is, a, is another one of the bulls that I think has has some upside relative to, to draft costs currently. What are the reports like on Porter right now, Gallagher? Uh, he's going to get managed on minutes. It's pretty much as simple as that. Um, so, yeah, but he's really good. Watching days, he was like almost a first rounder in Nightcat. Yeah. So, um, yeah, certainly around 100 or so. It's definitely, if you, if all, if like the well dries up on like the sleepers, quote unquote guys, then yeah, I mean, take a shot on Porter. What, remind me what his injury was. Everything. Um, well, he yeah. had a lot of ham, a lot of hamstring injuries. He had a knee injury last year, I think. He's had back injuries. He's had all sorts of stuff. But it was earlier in his career, it was upper leg, and it's just been uh, a lot of knee stuff, too. And last year, I think it was mostly knee. Yeah, I guess they were never super clear on it, right? Because we, we started getting into last season, and there was just, like, some weird chatter about it. And then all of a sudden, he's missing games and then missed a, a bunch of games. Yeah. Oh, he's it's had, a foot injury. He... Sorry. Yeah, it was foot. foot. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, yeah I mean, guys like that and Tobias Harris, like, those are the, the perfect – examples of the unsexy picks that are going to rate well in projection models and like you know you can just solidify your team by getting some of those guys and knowing you know there's more risk with porter but um like you said when he's out there he's putting up good numbers so i, I like you know he's just kind of a forgotten man really it feels like you you, don't, you almost don't even remember that he's on the bulls mm-hmm. so i like that a lot all right, let's circle back to the Warriors because you've got a bunch of other Warriors on here. You're just hating the Warriors in general. Look, man, the, the Warriors are going to make the playoffs. Everything's going to be all right. Let's uh, let's start with my namesake, Andrew nice. Wiggins. Is this is this the year? You don't think so. But, you know, when he got to Golden State, the defensive stats were better. Uh, I mean, look, Steph Curry being out there has to help him. I don't know. I, I, could, I could see Wiggins maybe being serviceable. The biggest problem with him normally is just killing you in, in uh, field goal percentage. Yeah, I'm not quite buying the defensive stats boost. I looked at kind of how and where he got them, and it just didn't seem sustainable to me. There were too many blocks like away from the basket and like kind of out of position helping, which he does not going to do as much because with Draymond Green out there now. So I think Draymond will cut into that. And again, just previous in previous years, it, Wiggins is just all scoring. 
So if you take away that defensive boost, even with a little bit of increase, and he shot the ball great before the trade too, so um, it's just a little thin. He just has to have a lot of things break right um, to go where he's been going. Yeah, and you got Wiseman and Draymond on here. Drew, are you yeah. just completely out on the Warriors like Gallagher here? <laughs> So I think from a seasonal perspective, it's tough to find good prices that you're excited about with them because I think a lot of them are getting their ADPs kind of lifted by the return of Steph. Um, Wiggins on this you know, smaller sample on FBKC stuff is is in the 80s in terms of ADP. I think we've got them around 100 in terms of in terms of eight cat value. And the challenge with Wiggins is just you know he doesn't he's not adding a ton of value in a ton of places and he's not really and then where he isn't great he does hurt you it's like volume shooting and and poor free throw shooting and so uh, i'm not as excited about him the warriors front court i think it's exciting for them as a team that they have more depth there now but i think from a fantasy perspective that's really challenging the guy honestly that i i would like to take shots on early in the season for the warriors front court is marquise chris um, I, he played so well down the stretch last year with him was a really talented dude. His whole career just hasn't kind of had, you know, things break his way or, or, you know, maybe, maybe focus issues, whatever it is, it just hasn't really worked. And I saw kind of the flashes at, at the end of last year of the type of talent that he was coming into the league. And now you add in Stephen Curry there for kind of, you know, pulling away some of the, the defensive attention and I, I like him early in the season, especially with, you know, Weissman being, you know, delayed at, at camp and in general taking some time to, to, to get together. I want to see how Looney looks in the preseason before, like, really getting behind this. But I, I've had, like, Marquise Chris circled as a guy that I could maybe take late in drafts to fill in some voids early in the season if I have some injury issues. Like, if I started off with a team with, like, LeBron, I got him because because the value came and he's going to be resting earlier, things like that, um, or in DFS. So he's the guy that I kind of have my my eyes on early, but it, it's going to take the right depth chart shakeout for it to work. But I, he's he's the guy that I have the most enthusiasm around. Yeah, he's still 23. Steve Curtis said that, quote, we're trying to push him because we think he can get a lot better. So uh, Marquise Chris is probably my biggest miss of my career. Uh, as a family, fantasy analyst, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm feeling him a little bit this year. All right, it's a sad sight to see Gallagher's lover boy Drew Holiday on here. I think it was probably the guy he pushed the most going into last season, and you know, it's a totally different situation now, and uh, just just breaks my heart a little bit. But point guard yeah. is thin, so I think Gallagher's probably still going to end up with him on some teams. But t- talk to us so. why we should have tempered expert. No, none. Oh no. I mean, I'm going to take Malcolm Brogdon instead. Um, yeah, I just don't trust Budenholzer. Uh, we know they kind of are going to feel uncomfortable with how they got burned in the postseason. So a little bit of management factor. We've seen Drew's kind of rates trend down, both from field goal percentage and free throw percentage. Hate to see that. Getting a little bit older now. So, yeah, he's not really a great catch-and-shoot guy either. He's really good on ball. Not going to get the on ball opportunity as much. So it's really not setting up great for Drew after it really set up well for him last year with the high pace and, you know, good assist guys, assisted buckets guys around him. So, yeah, system, bad system fit from a fantasy perspective. All right, well, we've covered a bunch. There's many, many more. If you come over to Establish Your Own, you can see the entire list of 30 players. Before we get out of here, Drew, I was hoping you could give us just a quick update on any thoughts you've had uh, out there in the underdog streets, you know, particularly with maybe the three or yeah. six man games. Yeah. So we did release updated rankings for three and six man games that are positional scarcity adjusted once again. So for those of you out there playing those games, um, we ha- we have something for for you uh, in in the in season package. I I have not been playing the three and six. I've just been playing the championship, the the twelve man drafts and. Uh, my first thought is, what does a guy got to do to get the number one pick? I'm like, <laughs> I'm 0 for 19 so far. I just want a Giannis team at some point. I'm just going to keep depositing until I get a Giannis team, which I think they've figured out. And so um, I that's been frustrating for me. But in general, ADP has shifted very quickly since we did episode 34. Um, I think we've had some influence on that, both with our content and in our in our projections. I do think a lot of the edge is still in roster construction and understand that you'll, you'll in these drafts, you'll still see like 
two teams out of your league that are doing things that make it almost impossible for them to win. I, I was in a draft the other day where somebody ended up with two wings and eight bigs. Like you got to play two wings every single week. Like that person's dead. Their second wing what was those two wings again. Dude. Uh, the right. second wing was V uh, <laughs> Mikhail Luke from, from Detroit. So, I mean, that team was like dead right off the bat. Um, so there's, there's, there's definitely people doing things that are mistakes there. And then I think the, the, the kind of soft finessing of understanding where you've drafted strengths early in the draft and how that dictates what you should do in the middle rounds and the later rounds, I think is an area of opportunity for a lot of people. There's also a lot of people in there that are just straight drafting off of our rankings, which look, you're going to build pretty decent teams that way. But this is why I think the positional uh, like resource allocation and roster construction are the edges that, that you can still attack. And what I mean by that is, like if you start a draft with Lillard and Booker or something like that, you you should assume that you're getting those two guys scores most week to fill out the guard spot and you should move away from guard for a little while. And if you do happen to get a value that you can't resist that falls to you at the guard spot, then that third guard is most likely going to fill in whenever those two guys aren't. And so you need to get away from them. And so these like kind of hyper fragile builds, I still think there's a lot of upside too, because some of the people who are just drafting straight off of rankings are going to end up with good teams on the whole, but imbalanced oper- ways for them to score the points that they need to score. And so if you start out kind of positionally heavy at, at one spot, you need to adjust resources as you go throughout the draft, which is why if you've been drafting against me and you say, oh, like Drew's not going straight off the rankings or stuff, uh, that's why I'm trying to I'm trying to understand kind of the resources I've put into each position and balance that out uh, to give myself a better chance at, at getting higher scores. Very good stuff. I think it's great practice too, just to, to understand how, look, a lot of the people that are doing this are serious players. So you just get a good idea of what smart people, you know, how they're valuing guys. So it, it's even good prep, you know, certainly good prep for your, for your season long stuff, but I think it's also helpful for DFS. And uh, just a note, we are not doing preseason content. I know the preseason starts tonight. Uh, we might get some stuff out next week just as a bonus, but nothing is planned at the moment. Gallagher is going to be starting a week, day review called three ball next week and we'll have more information on that so very excited about that we will post that to the podcast stream so if you're subscribed you're good to go we will have the the thing i'd say is we will not have dedicated preseason content every single day but we're going to have a few live shows uh behind the paywall we're going to do it looks like we're going to do maybe monday wednesday thursday is kind of the plan right now. Um, and with those, we'll do like kind of an abbreviated top plays type edition to go alongside it, but won't be every single day. Um, it's, you know, something that normally if we do, we would have kind of a, a package set aside for a full preseason coverage. We're just going to throw this in for existing subscribers um, a few days that, that we can get around to it and, and do the work on it. We'll, we'll certainly share some of the, the benefits of that work with you guys. Yeah, and hopefully for the next year. I mean, it's just such a quick turnaround with the season here. So yeah. hopefully next year we'll have a, a dedicated preseason package. It just wasn't in the cards this year. All right, we'll be back on Monday with um, Top 150 update. We'll be talking about risers and fallers. We'll give you kind of a recap of the, the basketball that goes on this weekend. Any takeaways for um, any season-long stuff or, or DFS. So hopefully hopefully we'll get some good nuggets out of the games. It'll be nice to have some basketball back uh, it's crazy. Gallagher, do you know, is this stuff going to be on League Pass? Are we going to be able to watch these games? That's my next call. Is uh, <laughs> my, my least favorite thing to do of the year is calling DirecTV and spending two hours on the phone figuring out if I'm going to be angry today. So, <laughs> All right. We'll see. Well, hopefully we can watch the games. All right, guys. Thanks for listening. Uh, good luck with the football this weekend, and we will talk to you on Monday.